Thank you. Thank you. Very good. All right. Um, this is about how God brought the Bible to us. You go down to the middle on the very the left side on the middle part. This is where we left off. Modern Greek and Hebrew Bibles. And then through translation, God was speaking as man was translating into modern language version. Everybody found where we are on the chart? So everybody uh, has a modern language version here this morning. I'm sure either a book or a, it's on your phone. Somebody, I mean, that, that, that took a lot of work to get down to the, the book you got on the table here, didn't it? Just look at the chart. Look at what God had to do to get that to us. So I hope that if we don't, if we didn't even go any further, uh, all of us would appreciate and thank God for what He did to get this book to us. It wasn't easy, and there's a, He used a lot of people uh, to get this book to us. A lot of sacrifice. People died. We didn't talk about it. Um, I don't think we talked about it. But, um, I meant to look this up, but you know, somebody asked about the first English Bible. I think it was John Wycliffe. Maybe you've heard of John Wycliffe. Do you know what happened to him? Yeah, burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English. So, I mean, uh, it was through great sacrifice that people. Um, did what they did to get the Bible to us, even in the modern English Bibles that we have. Uh, yeah. It says here, John Clark, the 1300s first English translation of Catholic Church executed. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you said that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But is that a footnote in your Bible? Bible? But there's another example that you gave, and I can't remember what it is. <clears throat> in quotation marks, it says, Into the name is a public display. And then the example is Arnold Schwarzenegger and Bruce Schreiber. Do you remember? I don't think I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I know. Into the okay, all in, right. In the verse. You're, you're talking about, it's verse Matthew 19. 28. Yeah, verse 19. Yeah, which is the only verse I have there, by the way. And I said that should be into not in. Yeah, we baptize yeah. into the name. All right, well, since you brought it up, I'll explain. I know what I said there. Forgot for a moment. Because what does Arnold Schwarzenegger have to do with, uh, yeah, with this? They their own name. Yes, I will. What does Arnold Schwarzenegger have to do in the same breath as William Tyndale? Well, I don't know. Uh, That's just what it has on my body. Okay, well, the purpose of the looking at that was that Jesus said, uh, make disciples of all the nations, teaching them all things that I've commanded you. So let's review that. What does that have to do with translation? Everything. You have to tell them without being translated water, language they're speaking. Let's get them out Okay. Can't teach them what Jesus commanded if they don't understand it. If it's not in their language, there has to be a translation. So in that passage, Jesus, in essence, well, he was directing that the Bible be translated into how many languages? All of them. And people are still in the process. There, there are remote tribes that don't have a Bible. Uh, Josh, you were just there in Guanajuato. Many of those tribes don't have a Bible, right? I think I think I think that's true. They have they have what's called um, like a national language called Bishlama, and they have a Bible in that language. But they have local dialects, many of them that they don't have Bibles in those languages. Yeah. So there's still a lot of work to do. Oh yeah. So I remember when John Gooding first went over there, they translated. You know, uh, they translated John 3.16, one verse, in the dialect of those 
people, right? Yeah. That was a start. That's a good start. Good start yeah. John three sixteen. Anyway, now your footnote in your Bible has nothing to do with translation. It had to do with he said baptizing them. The literal translation is into the name. So. The reason that's significant is when a person gets baptized, they are being placed into the name of Christ, or name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When do you? When are you placed into Christ? The moment you believe. The moment you believe. But being placed into His name is a different thing. It's where you publicly take His name. Like somebody could believe. And they're in Christ the moment they believe, but they might, they might not openly identify with him. And they're, in the Gospel of John, we read about secret believers. Why were they secret? Because they were not men. Persecution. And you still have that in many places in the world. People believe in Jesus, but they're afraid to openly identify or that they're going to be persecuted. So, baptism... Uh, was and still is a special way that God's given us to openly identify ourselves as believers. So when you get baptized, you're taking on his na the name publicly. You're identifying with his name. I am a child of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the term is into, it's ace, into the name. Because, what we, that, therefore, what would you say about it? A believer who has not been baptized. He hasn't taken the name of he hasn't, he hasn't taken the name of Jesus the way Jesus said to. So a long time ago, I hadn't used that illustration in a long time. Arnold Schwarzenegger was married to whom? Some of you know. Maria Shriver. Maria Shriver. Not Maria what? Well, I've never heard her called Maria Schwarzenegger. Why isn't she called? Too long. She didn't like She didn't work out. Yes. Here you go. For whatever reason, she married Arnold. From all, I'm sure they were married because later they got divorced. Okay. But didn't, didn't they get divorced? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just she, they were famous at the time, and I was just using an illustration to illustrate that there are there are women that that are legitimately married to their husband. They just don't take his name. Maria Shriver is a good example. Uh, there are many others, but that she's one. A believer who's not been baptized is a Maria Shriver Christian. She's. That believer is married to Christ, but that believer hasn't taken his name. Thank That's you. what that was. Thank you. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Does any? Uh, we didn't. I didn't intend to get into that. Anybody have a question about that? <laughs> yeah. All right. Now the next. Uh, the next section is, we go from modern languages. And through authority recognition, where God is ruling and man is revering, it leads to the place of the Bible in our lives. So let me say it this way. It's one thing to have a Bible. It's another thing for the Bible to be a part of your life, right? I mean, most people have a Bible. I'm sure there are some people that don't, but most people have a Bible, I guess. I, get, I would believe that all of you, well, you all do have a Bible. In America, most people have a Bible somewhere, I guess. Maybe not. I don't know. It would be good to find out. Maybe somebody's going to serve. Do you have a Bible in your home? I wonder how many people do or don't. I think it's a lot, though. But what good is it to have a Bible in your home? If it's just a... If it's just sitting and if it's just closed and sitting there, it's no good at all. I'm 
with all due respect, yeah. um, Hours, not it, it doesn't do any good to have a Bible unless you open it. But then what? And then what? Understand. Yeah, it's got to be. It needs to have a party part of your life. It needs to have a place in your life. Otherwise, it's not profitable. And that's where the uh, in the arrow on the diagram, authority recognition. This is my authority. If if you have the attitude, this Bible is my. It's it has an authoritative rule in, in my life. God is ruling, and I'm revering. What would revering, what would that word imply? Pay attention. Pay attention, have respect. Well, I, I, I want it, I want it, I take it seriously. I take it seriously what, what God has said. I revere what God has said. I wish I'd put some more scriptures there. I've only got two, but I want to add a couple more. And I want to, the first one I want to look at is Gen in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, Genesis chapter 3. Okay, in uh, Genesis 1 and 2, we have the creation of the world and Adam and Eve. Now, in Genesis 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? All right. What does this verse have to do with authority recognition of God's word? God's authority is being questioned, or the word of God, if I should say. Yeah, he turns around, that's not what God said. He's questioning, he's getting Eve to question what God said. Right. Now, it wasn't written down in the Bible, but how did God communicate? Verbally. Adam and Verbally, but it's God's word, okay? So what Satan's... Um, um, plan here was was to get her to do what? Sin. Well, I, yeah. Sin. And that, where, did, where did that start? Questioning God's word. Yeah. To question God's word or to not seriously think about or remember what God really said. Because what's the, what's the question? Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every of the garden, and you may know the story, you may not, but let's let's attack it here. What's the answer to the question? Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He didn't do that. The opposite before he said. Did he say that? No. no. But what's Satan trying to do here? We'll get her to think. Well, did maybe he did say maybe that? Maybe you don't quite understand what he was. Yeah. And maybe I don't have to pay close attention to what God said. Or maybe I don't go back to Adam and say, Adam, what did God say? In other words, Satan is trying to get her to doubt or disrespect or to question and not get an answer to find out the clarity on what God said. Because what did God say, by the way? Okay, let's hear that. What? You may eat of every tree except the one. Yeah. So he gave him the exact opposite. Of what he said. Right. He's playing. See, now there's a sense in which God said it. You shall not eat of every tree. Right. There's a sense in which that was true. Because of the one. That yeah. Turned around. You can't eat of every tree. But the but Satan kind of twisted what God said. God said, you can eat of every tree. 
except what? So it was where the emphasis was put. Satan was putting a different emphasis uh, on what God said to get her to question and ultimately, as Alice said, to sin. So when Adam and Eve ate of the tree, what was the root thing that they did? Disobey what? The word. The word of God. They disobeyed the word of God. The, the God's word was not authoritative in their lives when they ate of the, of the tree. And I, they, they knew it down deep. They knew they were wrong. And we know that from what happened afterwards. They, they hid from God. They knew that they were disobeying God's word. And that's the whole point of bringing this up is they didn't recognize the authority of God's word. They didn't revere what God had said. And I think that's the, the biggest trap of all is to not revere what God says and to either not pay attention to it, ignore it, or to deliberately disobey. Okay, question about that? Comment? Okay, let's turn to Psalm uh, chapter 1. Psalm 1. And uh, I want to read kind of the opposite of what we just read in Genesis 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he shall, whatever he does shall prosper. Okay, what's this passage say about recognizing the authority of God's word? What what anything stand out to you here? You're gonna be blessed. Yeah. Yeah. Always be in your mind. Yes. Yeah, where'd you get that? Meditating. Day and night. Day and night. Day and night. Right. Any other any other, anything else stand out to you about the place of the Bible? It's gonna be a lot of water, which is uh, you know, paramount for physical life. So like spiritual spiritual water, yeah. Okay. Also says that the weed will not wither. So not only is it true and good now, but it's true and good forever. Okay, good. In my Bible, in verse 2, it says, His delight is in the law of the Lord. Does everybody have that translation, or does anybody have something different? Delight is in the Lord's instruction. Okay, I like that. That's authority recognition. To not just say, okay, God said it. But, man, I, I, I delight in knowing what God said. This, this, this makes me happy and excited to know this is what God says, and this is the direction God's given me. Um, <laughs> yes. Blessing. God promises to bless those who let the Bible have a place in their lives. I can see that in in my young son's behaviors in their lives that they they appreciate rules and authority. They don't ask for it explicitly, but they do implicitly. And when they get it. It's like a relief, I think, but it's, it's the way God made us, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> right. Okay, any comments about that? All right, let's turn over to Mark chapter 7.
verse uh, 9. Uh, Jesus is speaking here. He said to them, All too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. This is a loaded verse. Uh, straightforward and to the point, isn't it? What competes with God's word? Tradition. Tradition. Man's tradition is in competition with God's word, God's commandment. And uh, in the context, well, maybe you can pick it up. What kind of people is he talking to here? Religious traditions. Re religious people. I don't think he was talking to believers in this passage. He's talking to, uh, we can go back to verse 5. The Pharisees and the scribes are the ones that he's uh, speaking to. Back. Let's go back. Let's let's look at it. Verse five. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, "Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands?" He answered and said to them, "Well, does, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as is, as it is written, the people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me." teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. We do that to this day. Yeah. So the commandments of men, he boils that down to the word tradition. Because if it's the commandments of men, it's the traditions of men. It's not the word of God, it's the traditions of men. And uh, this is a pretty powerful passage when we think about authority recognition where someone would practice the things that they've heard from men rather than when it's in conflict with the actual uh, word of God. Okay, can you think, maybe we can think of some examples of this, that the traditions of men in contrast to what God has said in his word. Can you think of them, maybe some examples of how people follow traditions instead of the Bible, or what the Bible says. Infant baptism. Can I elaborate? <clears throat> Believing that you're endowing salvation on a, on a baby, that there's the tradition, especially with the, with the Catholic Church. Yeah. And there are, there are some traditions that say that salvation that occurs. There's others that do infant baptism, or they're not saying it's salvation, what, what would they say that they belong to the church or something? Well, they, they do it for original sin is what they say. It absolves them of original sin, which is the sin of Adam and Eve. Yeah, yeah in the Catholic Church they yes. would, yeah. What about infant baptism outside of the Catholic Church that maybe some... Uh, Bring them up in a Christian home. Yeah, it's more like a dedication. In their mind, it's more like a dedication. Although, if you if you read the liturgy, the book, the liturgy book, it sounds like salvation, even though people might not be thinking that. That's the way the the liturgy is written. Uh, okay, where's the chapter and verse in the Bible that talks about infant uh, baptism? It's not there. Uh, it's not there. Yeah. Not even close. I'm saying that because I, I can say it with confidence. There's not a word in the Bible about infant baptism. It's just not there. No one. It's not there. Uh, what does the Bible, who is to be baptized according to the Bible? Believers. Believers. Yeah, believers baptism. There's nothing in the Bible about infant baptism, so why do people do it? Tradition. What? Tradition. Where did they learn that? Man. Yeah, man's direction. Man's uh, tradition. Uh, that's a probably as good an example as you could think of, of a tradition, a religious tradition that's practiced pretty 
widely uh, in Christian circles that's just not in the Bible. It's a tradition of men. Uh, it's it's sad. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I was baptized as a baby, so I that happened to me. But then my parents realized, well, that was just a tradition of the church. And then later, I was baptized as a believer. So uh, maybe some of you had that uh, touch with that background. I don't know. What about, what about church membership? Is that an example of, it, of one? Okay. And I'm asking. I don't, I, I don't know of anything in the Bible that says that a person has to be a member of the church. They're baptized each time, yeah. Well, I, I mean, some people define member differently. And I haven't been a part of a church that has had members in a while. When Margaret and I were living in Hawaii, they wanted us to become members. I think there was something to sign. And I didn't sign it because, I didn't, because it wasn't in the Bible. And I didn't understand why they wanted us to do that. Good. Something about commitment or whatever, I don't know. Yeah. So. All right. Um. Yeah, what well, uh, many churches have church membership, or there's something that a requirement that has to be met in order to be a member of the church. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I went to agree. Yeah, I'm, I'm not asking. I'm stating it. They, yes, there are churches that do that. So I'm not. I'm aware. So of. my question is: Is that an example? And I mean, is it is it wrong because it's not in the Bible to do it, or? How do, how do we know if some, some tradition is contrary to Scripture, or maybe it's just not in the Bible, so maybe it's okay that the tradition is there? Yeah. Um, let's think that through. What does the Bible say? Who's a member of the church according to the Bible? How many believers? Every okay, every believer is a member of the body of Christ, universally. Yeah. The the universal. What what do I what would I mean by universal church? Catholic. No. What? No, no, no. That's all. What do you mean? Every believer in the world is universal. Yeah. You're every believer in the world is part of the body of Christ. Right? The body of Christ. It's the church. That's the church. There's the universal church, biblically, everybody, every Christian is a part of the, the body of Christ. But then what other kind of church is there? Local. Well, local. local church, that's what I was looking yes. for. The local church. So it, the New Testament teaches this, that there's the church universally, and then there are local churches. For sure, the church at Rome, the church at Corinth, the church at Thessalonica, you know, all these churches that you read about, these are local churches. But every believer is part of the body of Christ, which is the universal church. Do you have to be in a local church to be part of the universal church? No, because uh, you just don't. I mean, if, you, if you're never part of a local church, you're still part of of, of, of the body of Christ the moment you believe. But people that are part of the universal church are supposed to meet in local churches. That's the pattern in the New Testament. So, church membership. So, that, so th if you think about that, what, if you're part of the universal church, are you qualified to be a member of the local church? Yes. Yeah, automatically. Automat you're, you are a member of this local church in the eyes of God. Uh, you're right? Yeah. You're, just, you're just gathered. Right. You're a member of the body of Christ universally, and you're choosing to gather with other believers. So to put, to, to say, okay, now, but you have to, do something to become a member of the local church is a little odd if you think about the theology of it. Yeah. But I don't know. I, 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 local churches can have reasons for wanting 
to have a recognized membership. And that, now, we're getting into the weeds here a little bit. Why would a church feel or think or, or would, why would they need to have a recognized membership? Money. Well, what's money got to do with it? They want it. Yeah, but what would, what would that have to do with money? So that you know how many members you got, and you know how much you kind of make an extrapolation as to what your budget might potentially be. Okay. So, okay. What might be another reason? I would say commitment. Trying to call people to a level of commitment? Right. Like mindedness? Right. Yeah. Huh? Keep the out. Keep the riffraff out. <laughs> okay, there is there is one practical reason, and that leads to a whole other topic. But what were you going to say, Fred? <laughs> so right. one, one reason that I was given was that they wouldn't be able to exercise church discipline unless someone was a, was a member, and, you know, a member in the sense that they wanted us to be a member. Yeah, and that, that would be a reason. But that leads to a whole other set of questions. Now, uh, I'll tell you what I think is the most practical reason why a church would need to have members, and that to, to know who could vote. Oh, yeah. Who can vote when there's a, when there's a need for a congregational vote? Well, who gets to vote? Anybody that walks in the door? No, they need to be a member. And if you have a congregational form of government, then you'd have to have voting members, recognized or not recognized. So that would be, a, but then that leads to another question. What does the New Testament say about congregational church government? You're not led that way. You're led by a group of elders first yeah. and foremost, and the widespread congregation does not have that responsibility to make the decisions on how the church is led. Exactly. All right, so I got I got something now. <laughs> uh, the New Testament the New Testament teaches a uh, an elder led church, not a congregational led uh, church. And you can just think about the practical problems that happen. What what's a practical problem that happens when you have congregational? Um, it's difficult to make decisions. Who split? Who? Uh, who? How are the, how can I uh, say this? Who has the, uh, what, what individuals have equal, who has the authority? In a congregational government. Everybody. Everybody. So what about the Christian, let's say there's 10 Christians that are really walking with God and really seeking God. And you've got a hundred people that they they don't even they're on the membership roll, but they don't even go to church, and they're living in sin, but they're they're on the membership roll. How are their votes weighed? Even equally. Equally. Does that sound right? That's that's the problem you get into is the church should be led by those that are spiritual. The church should be led by those that are mature. The church should be led by those that are involved and know what's going on. But you have a vote where everybody on the membership roll gets to vote, and the people that don't even know what's going on have an equal vote with those that are, you know, involved. should have the weight. So uh, I just want to say this, this still is on topic because uh, congregational government is a tradition of the, it's a tradition. It's not you don't see that in the New Testament. In the New Testament, you see the church being led by elders who have to meet qualifications. 
Um, so we've, we've gone from one thing to another. We've started with infant baptism. We've gone to uh, membership. We've gone to uh, government, church government. Uh, another possible along this subject here. I don't ever remember in the Bible where it's mentioned that Jesus walked in uh, purple satin robes. And it seems like there's been a development through the hierarchy of the that it's more of a reflection of uh, look at us and not to him. And one of the ways they do that is by <laughs> elevating their status. And whatever means that is bigger churches, uh, more ornate robes, uh, ceremonies being <coughs> much more elaborate, this sort of thing. And of course, Jesus came in to uh, Jerusalem, I believe, on the back of the donkey. Came in meeting us. And so it seems that a lot of what we see today as developing tradition is uh, focusing more on the flesh. Are you talking about? Are you talking about the apparel of a of a clergyman? Well, that's just an obvious uh, vision of tradition, but it's um, it developed where it's more of a focus on on us instead of on Jesus. Yes, and that could be a, a dangerous well, tradition. That manifested. Yeah. I yeah, yeah, uh, we're getting pretty deep here, I'll just, yeah, when, when Jesus established the Lord's Supper, it was a meal, even all church historians recognize that in the early church, they celebrated the Lord's Supper as a meal together. And uh, somewhere along the way, the meal got dropped and it just became the, the bread and the cup. So that uh, pattern that is in the New Testament, the word supper means supper, <laughs> means meal. Um, that got changed into a tradition of just the bread and the cup. Right. Some churches have closed communion versus open communion. Yeah. That would be another tradition as well. Right. Okay, you said you had another one. Well, so in these verses, it's pretty clear that the traditions that Jesus is referring to are contrary to God's word. Right? Yeah. But it's, it's also probably true that there are some traditions of men that are not contrary to God's word. They're just supplemental maybe and they're not wrong not sin and they're fine is that right right okay so sure. probably good to distinct make that to distinguish between well of them. course we have a tradition here at cypress valley that we have a men's bible study on wednesday morning we've we've had this tradition for decades where is that in the bible is it wrong no because there are the Bible gives us freedom to do a lot of things, uh, to establish a lot of traditions that aren't contrary to the Bible at all. They fit within what the Bible says. He told us to meet together, study his word, make disciples. So to have a tradition of a men's Bible study on Wednesday mornings is a, is a tradition that fits within the parameters of the commandments of God. As a key word is, uh, if you're rejecting the commandment, it's a bad tradition. If you're accepting the commandment, it's a good tradition, right? Right. Yeah. Right. All right. Um, that was an interesting kind. We got into some weeds this morning. <laughs> hope, hope nobody got their feelings hurt. But that's the risk we take in the men's Bible study. We, we, we don't tell them what we're going to cover. Let's pray.